It is my great privilege to introduce to you the next speaker, who, first of all, in my humble opinion, is a great physician. First, he is a doctor of medicine, and then he pursued that special branch of medicine called psychiatry. He has written many inspiring articles. The last one, which I would call to your attention, perhaps he has written some since, if so, not to my knowledge. The Ego Factors in the Surrender of Alcoholism, of which we have had some reprints that we have passed around to members in our various groups in Rochester. We think it is one of the finest things that has been written in recent years. And of course, all of we alcoholics are endowed with this superego, which he so beautifully describes. And uh, would you indulge me in a story a moment? It's not too bad. I think that the alcoholic constantly has the problem of toning down the superego, and it's best illustrated by a story of a Rochester bus driver who had a bus full of people aboard at the five o'clock rush hour. And as he drew up to a stoplight and gathered enough more sardines to pack into the aisles, the light turned green. The bus started forward. And at that very um, uh, moment, a woman who was, I, I shouldn't say a woman, uh, it happened to be a female who was around 272 days pregnant, stepped down across the crosswalk and started across in front of the bus. He jammed on his brakes and all of the sardines nearly crashed into the front end of the bus. He slammed open that front door and said to the woman, he said, Lady, I want to tell you, you can get knocked down too. And so it is with we alcoholics. I think when I begin to see that superego cocking its head up just a little bit, I think of the story. It gives me great pleasure at this time to introduce to you Phil's friend of many years standing, a great friend of AA, a fine physician, scientist, and research man, Dr. Harry Thibault of New York City. Under ordinary circumstances, I should uh, thank the man who introduced me for his very nice remarks, but also for years I have been teaching the need for ego reduction. I'm not sure that my ego got sufficiently reduced by the introduction. When the invitation came to speak before this group, I immediately said, yes, I want to go. For many years, as you all know, I had been associated with AA, and all the experiences that I had had came flashing through my mind, and I had so much to say that I didn't quite know where to begin. And with your permission, I am going to use a manuscript so that the points that I want to make will not be forgotten. At an AA meeting, the speaker, as a rule, identifies himself as an alcoholic and then proceeds to tell his story, sprinkling garlands of wisdom and humor of both as he goes along. I shall also tell my story, although I am much less sure about matching either the wit or the wisdom of the AA speakers. I joined AA by proxy in 1939 when a patient of mine became a member of the New York group. Well do I remember my first meeting. It was tinged with excitement. 
AA was going on the air for the first time. One of the members, trying to rehabilitate himself, had talked with Gabriel Hita, who, on hearing his story, suggested that he, the AA man, appear on the program, We the People. This was the night, far too thrilling and special, for settling down to a regular meeting. The actual event was a bit of a letdown. The man from AA spoke briefly of his experiences. Gabriel Hita, plainly puzzled, asked a couple of pointless questions, and it was over. AA, however, had taken a step toward making itself known. Not a very big step, to be sure, but one of the many which finally led to its present position on the national and international scene. Later, I attended other meetings, more orthodox in character, and as I did, I developed the conviction that the group had hit upon a method which solved the problem of excessive drinking. In a sense, it was an answer to my prayers. After years of butting my head against the problem of treating the alcoholic, one could begin to hope. In retrospect, my first two or three years of contact with AA were the most exciting in my whole professional life. AA was then in its miracle phase. Everything that happened seemed strange, wonderful. Hopeless drunks were being lifted out of the gutter. Individuals who had sought every known means of help without success were responding to this new approach. To be close to any such group, even by proxy, was electrifying. In addition, professionally, a whole new avenue of problem of alcohol had opened up. Somewhere in the AA experience was the key to sobriety. Here was the first authentic clue after many years of fruitless effort. Needless to say, the possibilities ahead were most intriguing. Perhaps I could learn how AA worked, and thus could learn something about how people stopped drinking. All of which meant that I shared in the general excitement of those days. I could see some daylight ahead. My future in this regard was now clear. I would try to discover what made AA tick. In this quest for understanding, I would have never gotten beyond first base if it had not been for Bill and many of the early members. A study of the 12 steps helped a little, but of far greater importance were the many insights already possessed by Bill and the others into the process through which AA brought about its results. I heard of the need to hit bottom, of the necessity for accepting a higher power, of the indispensability of humility, ideas which had never crossed my professional horizon and certainly had never influenced my non-professional thinking or attitude. Revolutionary as they were, they nevertheless made sense, and I found myself embarked on a tour of discovery. I began to recognize more clearly what hitting bottom really implied, and I began to do what I could to induce the experience in others, always wondering what was happening inside the individual as he went through the crisis of hitting bottom. Finally, fortune smiled upon me again, this time from another patient. For some period, she had been under my new brand of psychotherapy designed to promote hitting bottom. For reasons completely unknown, she experienced a mild but typical conversion which brought her into a positive state of mind. Led by the newly found spiritual elements, weak though they were, she started attending various churches in town. One Monday morning, she entered my office, her eyes ablaze and at once commenced talking. I know what happened to me. I heard it in church yesterday. I surrendered. With that word surrender, she handed me my first real awareness of what happened during the period of hitting bottom. The individual was fighting his mission of being licked, of admitting that he was powerless. If and when he surrendered, he quit fighting, could admit he was licked, and could accept that he was powerless and needed help. 
If he did not surrender, a thousand crises could hit him and nothing would happen. The need to induce surrender became the new therapeutic goal. The miracle of AA was now a little clearer. For reasons still obscure, the program and the fellowship of AA could induce a surrender which could in turn lead to a period of no drinking. As might be expected, I too had a thrill of my own. I was getting in on what was happening, always an enjoyable experience. Still questing eagerly, I shifted my therapeutic attack. The job now was to induce surrender. When I tried to cause that, I ran into a whole nest of resistances to that idea. Totally new territory to be explored. As I continued my tour, it became ever more apparent that in everyone's psyche there existed an unconquerable ego which bitterly opposed any thought of defeat. Until that ego was somehow reduced or rendered ineffective, no likelihood of surrender could be anticipated. The shift in emphasis from hitting bottom to surrender to eager reduction all occurred during the first five or six years after my initial contact with AA. I well remember the first AA meeting to which I spoke on the subject of ego reduction. AA, still very much in its infancy, was celebrating a third or fourth anniversary of one of the groups. The speaker, immediately preceding me, told in detail the efforts of his local group, which consisted of two men, to get him to dry up and become its third member. After several months of vain efforts on their part and repeated nosedives on his, the speaker went on to say, finally I got cut down to size and have been sober ever since, a matter of some two or three years then. When my turn came to speak, I used his phrase, cut down to size, as a text around which to weave my remarks. Before long, out of the corner of my eye, I, could, I was conscious of a disconcerting stare. It was coming from the previous speaker. Looking a little more directly, I could see his eyes fixed on me in open-eyed wonder. It was perfectly clear that he was utterly amazed that he had said anything which made sense to a psychiatrist. <laughs> the look of incredulity never left his face for my entire talk. The incident had one value in my eyes. It showed that two people, one approaching the matter clinically and the other relying on his own intuitive report of what had happened to him, both came up with exactly the same observation, the need for ego reduction. During the past decade, my own endeavors have centered primarily upon this problem of ego reduction. How far I have been able to explore that territory is not at all certain. I have, however, made a little progress, and in the minutes remaining, I should try first to acquaint you with some of my findings, and second, to relate them to the AA scene as I see it. As I have already stated, the fact that hitting bottom could produce a surrender which cut the ego to size was evident fairly soon. In time, two additional facts manifested themselves. The first was that a reduced ego has marvelous recuperative powers. The second was that surrender is an essentially disciplinary function and experience. The first is merely repeating a fact known to you all. It is common knowledge that a return of the full-fledged ego can happen at any time. Years of sobriety are no insurance against its resurgence. No AA, regardless of his veteran status, can ever relax his guard against the encroachments of a reviving ego. Recently, one AA, writing to another, reported he was suffering, he had feared, from halotosis, an obvious reference 
to the smugness and self-complacency which so easily can creep into the individual with years of sobriety behind them. The assumption that one has all the answers, or the contrary, that one needs to know no answers and just follow AA are two indicators of trouble. In both, open-mindedness is notably absent. Perhaps the commonest manifestation of the return of ego is, the, is witnessed in the individual who falls from his pink cloud, a state of mind familiar to you all. This blissful state is a logical aftermath of surrender. The ego, which is full of striving, just quits, and the individual senses peace and quiet within. The result is an enormous feeling of relief, and the person flies right up to his twink cloud and thinks he has found heaven on earth. Everyone knows he is doomed for a fall. But it is perhaps not equally clear that it is the ego slowly making its comeback which forces the descent from the pink cloud into the arena of life, where, with the help of AA, he can learn how to become a sober person and not an angel. I could go on with many more examples familiar to you all to show you the danger of ever assuming that the ego is dead and buried. Its capacity for rebirth is utterly astounding and must never be forgotten. My second finding, that, e that surrender is a disciplinary experience, requires explanation. In recent articles, I have shown that the ego basically must be forging continuously ahead, and that operates on the unconscious assumption that if the ego could never be stopped. It takes for granted that it's right to go ahead, and in this respect has no expectation of being stopped and no capacity to adjust to that eventuality. Stopping says in effect, no, you cannot continue, which is the essence of disciplinary control. The individual who cannot take a stopping is fundamentally an undisciplined person. The function of surrender in AA is now clear. It produces that stopping by causing the individual to say, I quit. I give up my headstrong ways. I've learned my lesson. Very often, for the first time in that individual's adult and truly feel, thy will, not mine, be done. When that is true, we have become, in fact, obedient servants of God. The spiritual life at that point is a reality. We have become members of the human race. I have now presented the two points I wish to make. Namely, first, the ego is revivable, and second, surrender is a disciplinary experience. I next wish to discuss their significance for AA as I see it. Primarily, they say quite simply, AA can never just be a miracle. The single act of surrender can produce sobriety by its stopping effect upon the ego. Unfortunately, that ego will return unless the individual learns to accept a disciplined way of life, which means the tendency for ego comeback is permanently checked. This is not new to AA members. They have learned that a single surrender is not enough. Under the wise leadership of the Founding Fathers, the need for continued endeavor to maintain that miracle has been steadily stretched. The twelve steps urge repeated inventory, not just one. And the twelfth step itself, a routine reminder that one must work at preserving sobriety. More, moreover, it is referred to as 12-step work, which is exactly what it is. By that time, the miracle is for the other fellow. The traditions are also part of the non-miracle aspect of AA. They represent, as Bill has said, the meanings of lessons of experience. 
They serve as guides for the inexperienced. In reality, they check the ways of the innocent and the unwary. They bring the individual down to earth and present him with the facts of reality. In their own fashion, they say, pay heed to the teachings of experience or you will court disaster. It is not without reason that we talk of the sober voice of experience. My stress in the non miracle elements of AA has a purpose. When I first made my acquaintance with AA, I rode the pink cloud with most of its members. I too went through a period of disillusionment, and fortunately for me, I came out with a faith far stronger than anything a pink cloud can supply. Mind you, I'm not selling miracles short. They do loosen the individual up. I know, however, now, the truth of the biblical saying, by their works you shall know them. Only through hard toil and labor can lasting results be obtained. As a consequence of the need for work to supplement any miracle, my interest in the non-miracle features has grown. I can accept more truly the necessity of organization, of structure, which curbs as well as guides. I believe there must be meetings like this one to provide a sense of belonging to a big working organization of which each individual is but a part. And I believe that any group of individuals who fails to participate in the enterprise of the organization is rendering himself and his group a disservice by not submitting to the disciplinary values inherent in those activities. We may be keeping the ego free of entanglement, but he is also keeping himself unstopped. His chance of remaining sober are not of a high order. He is really going it along, and is headed for another miracle, which may not come off the next time. In closing, let me reaffirm my proxy membership in AA. I have been in on its glowing start, and I shared in its growing pains, and now I've reached the state of deep conviction in the soundness of the AA process, including its miracle aspects. I tried to convey to you some of my observations on the nature of that process. I hope they will help in making the AA experience not just a miracle, but a way of life which is filled with eternal values. AA has, I can assure you, done just that for me. Thank you.